Welcome, welcome, welcome to Bite Size B2B Marketing, where our aim is to give B2B companies easy to digest tips to help improve their marketing efforts. Today, I'm not joined by my co-host Mitch, who's currently feeling a little bit under the weather, so pray for Mitch, but the show must go on. And this week, we have a very special guest joining us. So introducing our guest, Chris, how's it going, man? Steve, thanks a lot for having me. Mitch, hope you feel better. That was a killer <laughs> intro too. Looking forward to getting into it today. Nice one, nice one. So uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Honestly, really, really appreciate you for doing this. And uh, this episode essentially came about because we tagged yourself in one of our previous episodes. You left a comment. Uh, Mitch pushed me to say, look, come on the show. And luckily took that chance. And, and here we are now. So uh, to give a bit of background about that post, it was essentially presented the results of two experiments related to self-reported attribution. And this is where you add a text field to a high intent sales form on your website, asking, how did you hear about us? And a lot of people push back when you talk about doing this, adding another step to the form. Our conversion rate's going to drop, but what you were saying is, here's our data. Hopefully this gives you the confidence, but ideally test it out for yourself. And this wasn't necessarily related to just self-reported attribution, but we wanted to talk today really in general about marketing and, and just tactics and run experiments and, and make your own conclusions. So jumping straight in really to kick us off, Chris, and to set the stage, when you hear experimental mindset in relation to marketing what, what does this mean to you first i just want to get into sort of like the the reason why we're all why we decide to have this podcast which is that we presented this data about self-reported attribution and we had seen this anecdotally as we've rolled this out with more than probably 50, somewhere between 50 and 100 b2b companies including ourselves over the past 18 months hmm. anecdotally saying hey we're not seeing drops in conversion rates pipelines growing we're getting good data and then seeing the pushback from a lot of people that say, hey, if you add a field to your form, then your conversion rates are going to go down. A mindset that originated when the, I, the goal of conversion rates was to get as many MQLs as possible. So all the studies that have been done that are about, hey, if you add a form field to your form, then your conversion rates are going to go down is in an experimental situation where you're running 1,000, 10,000 people a month through Google ads, low intent traffic, stuff like that, trying to squeeze 0.5% more MQLs out of it, which is an entirely different situation than when you put this on your high intent, declared intent demo form, contact mm -hmm. sales form, way lower volume, way higher intent when someone gets to that page. Like there, there's a lot of different dynamics based on the mindset of what people have about like form conversion rates and the data and the findings based on old studies and old situations and bringing that into new situations as a way to say no. And so we ran multiple like collaborative experiments with B2B companies looking at the form conversion rates, mainly like an AB test or a split test about having some traffic go to a field that has a, how did you hear about us on it? And the exact same half the traffic goes to a place that doesn't have that on it. Hmm. Or half the traffic goes to a place where that field is required. And another part, the other half of the traffic goes to a place where that field is not required. And the findings broadly right now, and we definitely need to study this at a larger sample size to come up with like true findings, but initial data shows that the differences between making it optional or required does not have an impact on conversion rates. So you might as well make it required. And three separate studies, we found that the adding the field, how did you hear about us as an additional field or swapping it for an unnecessary field and using that instead mm -hmm. uh, did not result in decreased conversion rates. Actually, the gross number conversion rate actually went up in, in many of the studies, but was not statistically significant. So we found no difference between the two. And I just, I, the point of this here is for marketers, instead of just using old knowledge and saying, Hey, we're not mm -hmm. going to do this because this study happened in 2014 about it. And we've been told to not add fields to our form to instead look at it in a much more curious, experimental data driven type of mindset with the idea that, Hey, like the world is different. Now things with our strategy is different. Why don't we relook at some of these and challenge some of these old assumptions that we have about what we should be doing or not? And so I think that's like the main value that I bring to the B2B marketing space is that I just look at things that we're doing, like how we use last touch attribution or play with our U shape, W shape attribution model when we don't realize the flaws in, in attribution software overall, setting KPIs based on leads, only producing gated content, but optimizing feel like a lot of stuff like that that we used to do and me just 
looking at it and with a blank slate right now and just saying, why do we still do this? Why yeah. did we start doing it in the first place? What was the driver? Is that is why we did it in the first place still relevant right now? Is there something else that we should be doing? How are buyers changing right now? What do buyers want? Where are they spending their time? Asking a lot of curious questions and then ending up at your own conclusion about what the best strategies are. I think that's a key part of a B2B marketing leader's job right now is looking at all of the available information and then being able to make good decisions based on that information and then validate those decisions inside of your own business. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good point as well, like touching even the research that we did for that previous episode where it was looking at self-reported attribution and a, the majority of the people say putting out some of that research were those attribution companies with, you have to, as you're saying, like take that with a pinch of salt, even not only was that the old school mindset, but like they've got that vested interest in terms of what they what they want to put forward in terms of how how reliable it is and just touching on the data that you found one point from their studies was dismissing it because i think one of them was saying it's like over 30 or 40 percent of the the data received from that was just rubbish it was people just typing in or just not putting anything in there have you found with the research you put out as well the field that has been formed in about how did you hear about us it's been useful information you've been able to use that and invest more in certain areas that were previously hidden before adding this I think the thing a lot of people miss is that no matter what data you get, it's valuable. If you're getting people in there submitting spam, trash, garbage, it's probably coming from performance marketing. It's probably coming from Google ads optimized for max conversions that's going to drive spam. It's a flag to you to say, how is this person even getting to our website? Yeah. And so yeah. like, if you get that 90% of the time, it means you're not effectively creating demand and buyers see you as a commodity when they enter a buying cycle for a category. Regardless of the data that you get, whether you think that you should be getting podcasts and LinkedIn or whether you're getting spam and search all the time, it's an indicator either way. It's an indicator of how effectively, how effective are you at creating your own demand using your own owned channels? How mature is your category and how much organic market demand should be created through search and things like that where you don't create the demand, but it's created elsewhere? How does word of mouth play into uh, mm -hmm. the impact and how people buy stuff? You can see the exact people that are giving referrals to, to your business. We get that. We can see what companies and partners are referring business. There's tons of insights that you'd never get with touch point based digital attribution software. And so I'm not saying that it, one should replace the other. I'm saying that we need a much larger data, sh data set to make business decisions than just looking at point based digital attribution. And the effectiveness of these tools continues to decline to a level where now uh, many of them rely on account level de-anonymized IP traffic to try and correlate a LinkedIn ad, one, one LinkedIn ad impression hit this account. And so therefore marketing effectively drove that account in pipeline. And they create very, very generous attribution models in marketing that does a great job in justifying spend and does a very poor job in saying, how are we going to scale our business? And the real point of attribution is not to prove ROI. It's to figure out how the fuck are we going to scale our business? Yeah, exactly. And I suppose it could be an it depends answer. But in terms of this, have you found that having self-reported attribution has put some water on the fire of certain channels? Like, is it is it uncover more insights as saying that we're wasting money on this channel versus another channel? If you're running lead gen, the majority of B2B companies spend a majority of program dollars on lead based or lead generation based activities. If you're running lead gen, you have all the data that you need to see whether it's working or not without self-reported attribution. Just go into the CRM. Look at where the, all the leads were sourced, track them to qualified pipeline and revenue, look at conversion rates, cost of qualified opportunity, customer acquisition cost, cost per lead. Look at all that different data and it's all available to you about whether it's working or not. You don't need any additional attribution. It's crazy how few companies that run heavy lead gen strategies never actually look at the full picture there because they'd have a lot of data immediately about what's working and what's not and it's sitting in their CRM right now. If your strategy is purely lead gen demand capture, you probably don't need self-reported attribution. If your strategy is that we're trying to educate a market, create a movement, win a category battle, build a new category, grow our company quickly, like the demand creation is a necessary part of the equation. And if you are going to take a demand creation strategy, you need additional measurement models because touch point based digital attribution is simply inadequate. And so self-reported attribution becomes a free, easy to implement rev one type of demand ca demand creation attribution and then from there you can add on qualitative customer insights you can add market research surveys you can add 
platform-based digital metrics as leading indicators. There's a lot of things that you can do beyond that, but self-reported attribution becomes like just such an easy way to close the gap in measurement for companies where most B2B companies want to do the things that I'm talking about that get measured by attribution software. They want to post a social media content and dark social content. They want to create a podcast. They want to do live events. They don't want to be doing lead gen activities all the time to feed SDRs. If you want to, if you want to change that type of stuff, you must adjust the measurement model. And so I find self-reported attribution just is a great way to give the entire company insight and confidence into what's actually working right now because customers say it, not because software spits it out at us. And so we literally take it, we, the submission comes in, we push it into our company Slack channel. Every single person at our company has access to the Slack channel and everybody knows what's driving demand right now. Is it Chris's LinkedIn? Is it our podcast? Is it the experiment we're running on YouTube? Is it a lot of word of mouth? Is it like, is, are we trending more toward like search and demand capture? What is happening right now? And so we get all of those insights qualitatively, and then we've created automation to be able to package it quantitatively in a way that most B2B executives would expect it. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've created that for ourselves. We built that for ourselves last summer, and now we've automated it into a, a Salesforce automation so you can download it inside of your Salesforce instance, and it does everything automatically for you. And then in terms of adding that additional field to the form in terms of experimenting with that or in general, say, running other marketing experiments, let's say I am in charge of marketing at a B2B company and the the powers that be above, upper management, leadership team, they're either new to this or they're unsure on this. How can we make a compelling case alongside, say, presenting your data to run the experiment? Are there any specific steps that I could take there? My recommendation here is not to request additional budget. It's to find identify something that's not working and then shift existing budget. So that's what I would do. I would run an analysis of all the things that you're doing to look at all your lead gen programs, map it at Google ads level, map it against either keywords or campaign groups look at all the money that's being spent that's driving no pipeline and no revenue for your sales team and reallocate that to something else. So one, don't ask for new budget, just reallocate budget that's already being spent and not and clearly not being spent effectively. Number two is you got to, you have to set up measurement to properly measure your experiments. If you're going to try and do a podcast, you're going to try and run Reddit ads an experiment that's working well for us right now, or if you're going to try and get your company TikTok off the ground, and you don't have any level of demand creation attribution, and you're just relying on someone clicking through your organic TikTok video and clicking on your website and filling out a form to get a demo or download your ebook, then you are gonna be dramatically under-reporting the impact of that program. So measurement is another one. And the last one is that I truly believe that companies should not be running many new experiments until they already have things that work. Imagine a company, we got 150 people, the marketing team's probably 10, maybe 15 at that size in a venture funded company. And they spend $2 million a year, they're doing this stuff, they're not really sure what's working and what's not. And the real solution in that situation is to find the one or two things that are already working and then go way harder at them. Hmm. But what most companies do is they say, oh, we don't really know what's working. Let's go launch our podcast. Let's go try something new that we've never done before versus looking at all the things that we've already done and figure out which ones are working and have the opportunity to scale. If you're a 200, 150, 200 person company, you got something that's working in marketing. Yeah. And so yeah. just figure out what that is and then press it hard. That's what, I, that's what I've done in the business the entire time. LinkedIn worked, crush it. Podcast yeah. started working, crush it. We have like almost six to 12 months between experiment phases, like experiment, find LinkedIn, and then spend like six months to a year, just push LinkedIn. Then we have a cadence on LinkedIn. There's an ongoing experimentation of images, videos, things like that. It's like micro innovation in a channel once it's, once it's running, then the podcast, then podcasts and live events for two years. We don't touch anything else and really make that work. Now you got LinkedIn and podcasts and live events running and then at the next phase now it's like TikTok and youtube are the experiments and we haven't figured out which yeah. one's going to work we're not in the phase of like what are we going to push yet you don't need that many things to have your marketing deliver massive results you don't need a lot of actual programs you need things that can consistently drive pipeline and impact buyers so yeah. it's about identifying the right core set of experiments to run and then knowing when to know getting the signal of when to say hey forget these other things let's go push all in on this thing 
In terms of that as well, like kind of going back a bit where you were saying there, this was successful, this was successful, this was successful. How long would you stick at something and then cancel that experiment? And do you have any examples of, say, things that you have tried in the past that haven't gone as planned? When you're doing an experiment, the biggest thing to recognize, this is truly like more of an experience thing, is understanding is the channel not or program not going to work for me or is it just the way that I'm running the channel or program that's the problem? Yeah. So that's a distinction that a lot of companies struggle with, right? Tons of B2B companies in 2019 were like, we tried Facebook, it didn't work for us. Facebook's not for B2B. That's their mm-hmm. conclusion. They thought it was the channel's fault. Meanwhile, we're spending millions of dollars a month for B2B Facebook ads in 2019. It was our best performing B2B channel by far, way more effective than LinkedIn in 2019, pre iOS 14. It was how they were using the channel, yeah. spending $2,000 a month on retargeting for ebook downloads. That's why Facebook wasn't working for them. It was how they were doing it, not the channel's fault. But there are other instances where it's like, hey, the channel isn't ready yet. I would argue for a lot of B2B companies that have small total addressable markets that TikTok is not ready for them. That they yeah. should go somewhere else. Right? Yeah. If you have a big total addressable market, TikTok might be a good space for you. But if you're in like enterprise B2B running some level of a like enterprise ABM motion, it's probably not the best place to spend your time. Part of it is about just being able to recognize is it is the issue that I picked the wrong place to experiment or is it how I'm running the experiment? So on LinkedIn, for instance, like Within 30 days, I was getting close one deals when I posted on LinkedIn in 2019. Like it was obvious that it was working. And then I went from one customer to three customers. Like at that point, experiment proven, you know what I mean? Now it's in a lot of companies because the goals are so high, that wouldn't be considered a successful experiment. Yeah, And they probably wouldn't have measured it the right way. So they wouldn't even know they closed two deals off of it. But on LinkedIn, it took from April to August. So whatever that amount of time is like four months. To, for me to say, forget everything else, we're going all in on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. And the podcast was even faster. It was like almost immediate impact. But the problem is that because I'm in there writing the LinkedIn post, answering the comments, doing the live event, seeing what the chat is like, seeing how many attendees are on there, seeing what people are feedback on, getting the live questions, listening to what people are leaving for reviews in the podcast, because I'm doing it all, I see the qualitative signals almost immediately. Mm. I know it's going to work immediately, but the executive in their boardroom that's not looking at that type of stuff, isn't doing the work, just looking at top level business metrics against their goals is not going to have the insight to say, Hey, there's actually something here. We should keep going. And so there's a, you, you gotta be at that level of detail to see the early signal. Yeah. I feel like even that's a similar thing with our sales and I say our own marketing is that it's yeah giving it enough time and also just not spreading too thin I think that's something that we see quite a lot with our clients especially with LinkedIn now you see some some paid ads agency get some good results with something and then suddenly everyone's like okay look we need to try this attention gets diverted quite a lot and moved into different places so yeah there were, um, there's another one on this level a story that I had in like 2017 about being in the details to see the thing immediately while executives don't I ran my first b2b Facebook ad sometime between 2016 and 2017 hmm. and we ran a small test five thousand dollars and at that point I was like the price of ads were so low the targeting was so good for b2b you could target against accounts and job titles and all this stuff that I was getting people to watch it like a four or five minute demo of our product for 16 cents or something. Yeah. And we're sending a sales rep to go get on a plane and be in a hotel to do a demo. It's costing us 10 grand or more to do a demo. Why? And it's 16 cents for them to watch our demo video. Why wouldn't we just keep doing this? Yeah. And it took six, six to nine months to get executives to see that pattern when I saw it immediately. So there's, it's another thing. I don't really know what the recommendation here is because I recognize that many executives are not going to get into this level of detail, but you got to be able to understand enough to see the signals. Nice. And in terms of just whilst we're still talking on tactics, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about Reddit. Is that for Refine Labs or is that for your clients that you found kind of some success with Reddit ads? We've been using Reddit paid ads and now our customers are also doing more organic plays there. Um, and on the media side, yeah, we're targeting against CFOs and VPs of finance. We're targeting against cybersecurity and security engineers and things like that. And 
the ability to target against a thread or a topic is super interesting. So you're not necessarily targeting that we want to go after VPs and CFOs. We're just going to target threads that VPs and CFOs will, would be the ones who read. Mm -hmm. uh, and we deploy media there. We found actually from a creative standpoint that meme creative has actually been working the best at driving B2B enterprise deals. We're talking 40K to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year ACVs. Yeah, where the buyers come in and saying, I want a demo. I heard about you from this Reddit meme. <laughs> it's just crazy that the the there's not a single B2B marketer that would thought that meme creative would drive results for enterprise SaaS on Reddit, not yeah. a single person. And somebody's yeah. got to be out there testing it. So that's what we that's what we do here, hoping to continue to expand the learnings, understanding how the channel would properly scale, if at all. So we're in that phase now, but in order to go out and experiment on Reddit, you have to have a pr pretty robust existing set of demand programs, which is another thing that I told as a large company, like there's no sense in experimenting with Reddit. If you can't create a podcast, if yeah. you can't run LinkedIn ads and drive results with your target customers, if you can't have someone at your company post on LinkedIn four times a week as a personal brand, there are some things that are just far more obvious and far more effective. And so the idea is trying to be able to prioritize what's the first priority, what's the second priority, and how does this waterfall down to all of a sudden, two years later, we got five programs that are working. We do a live show every week. We have this podcast. We have this LinkedIn content that goes out. We have Reddit ads and we figured out LinkedIn ads. And now all of a sudden we have like a map two years later, have a incredible marketing mix because we methodically worked through how we're going to build this. We prioritized the right things. We drove results across the way. We built things that were sustainable and consistent. So yeah, that's about like prioritizing and spacing it out is another place where I think it's a mindset shift for a lot of executives. Nice. And in terms of the programs going well, say an in-house marketing team, the programs going well, what do the steps look like to then say hiring people in? What does the process look like for ramping up this program and really getting the most out of it? Yeah. The first question is how do we all define what doing well means, right? For yeah. some people doing well might mean we got 10 MQLs yesterday. Another person might say we need a million dollars in revenue, right? Doing well is very dependent on each individual company and their goals. As an initial experiment, I think that doing well means that we've successfully had somewhere around 10 sales conversations that have been driven through that type of program that have resulted, some level of them have resulted in pipeline that meet standard conversion rate benchmarks. Yeah. So like if that is initial doing quote unquote doing well, mm. then from there, like we figured out that we can get 10 sales meetings. Now we have to figure out how can we, now we figured out we can get 10 sales meetings that have whatever 40, 50% convert into a qualified op not just 10 sales meetings that all die on the vine, right? So it's actually a little bit further than that. Now that we figured that out, now we got to figure out how do we do that repeatably? How do we get that to happen every month? How do we get that to happen every week? Whatever your time period is. What, what is the mix of content, post frequency, media amplification, POV in the content, the right messaging and mapping, the right ability to measure it, the right way to create leading indicators to know whether or not we're on track or off track? Like that's the next step. How do we do this repeatably? Once you can figure out how to do it repeatably, post on LinkedIn seven days a week and get at least three sales meetings every month or whatever your thing is, then you got to figure out how do we go, how do we go from three meetings a month to 10 meetings a month? Then it's into, into scale. That's when we think about, we think about adding technology. We think about adding people, external or internal consultants. We think about adding media dollars at that stage, which is that like, Hey, we have a repeatable thing that we do every single week or month and we get a repeatable outcome out and it matches our cost efficiency or business level targets. Now let's figure out if we can make this work. Like, is this the thing that's going to drive our business forward for the next 12 months? Let's start pushing the pedal down a little bit. And I typically find that companies just do that out of the gate. So before they've gotten 10 demos, before they've had 10 sales meetings, they're just like, okay, hundred grand, just go and dump that on LinkedIn ads. And you just end up spending a hundred thousand dollars on something you didn't don't know whether it's going to work or not. And if it doesn't, if you can't get it to work at five thousand a month, there's no way it's going to work at a hundred thousand a month. There's a a more methodical process to this, which which is essentially increasing the investment in the program as the results dictate. Yeah. As you grow results, you increase investment. It's not complicated. When I 
our first podcast episode I did with AirPods and an and a Apple webcam. <laughs> uh, yeah, Oz was, Oz was. Yeah. Then 20 episodes in, I got a cheap microphone. Then 40 episodes in, we got a better video camera. Now we have lights and a best mic in the industry and all this other stuff. Yeah. But yeah. we didn't just like we didn't just buy all the shit for episode one. Figure out what's going to happen and then dictate how you invest your time and your money into it based on the impact that it has. Yeah, exactly. Not too long ago, me and Mitch were sharing a mic together and then now we have our own mics. We'll get up to your mic level soon, but yeah, I think fully agree. It's yeah, start out and Gary Vee's such a kind of famous proponent of that kind of mindset as well as like you don't need these fancy things to just put some content up on YouTube or put anything out on LinkedIn. So in terms of if there is a CEO or a member of the leadership team who's got to listen to this or listening to hear hearing you talk regularly and is kind of like looking to experiment but their team isn't how, how can these leaders encourage experimentation within their teams by recognizing that every single behavior that happens in your company specifically on your marketing team is driven around how you set kpis and develop attribution mm. and how you act as an executive team and what behaviors you demonstrate but it's mainly driven by kpis and attribution Cool. And once you once you recognize that, it's almost like sales. It's almost like sales team comp and spiffs, right? You can you can like dictate or incentivize behaviors to your sales team for what you want them to do, right? You want them to actually go and expand accounts. You're going to pay them 1.2x on expansion versus net new or whatever spiff you put in place. You can do the same thing in marketing. It doesn't actually have to be in, like incentive or financially driven. Just by changing the KPIs and the attribution model, you can incentivize specific, specific activities, or you can open up the ability to use certain activities that most companies restrict based on the attribution models that they use in their company. If you use a software based UTM digital tracking based attribution, and that's the sole way you measure success, your team will never mm. run a podcast. Yeah. Or if they do, it'll look like it's failing and you'll cut it within 90 days, which probably has happened to people that are listening to this podcast. And it happened to me in 2019 as the head of marketing. Yeah. By recognizing that the KPIs are going to drive all the behaviors, if you score your team on, we need 10,000 MQLs and you're getting 12,000 and they're 120% to plan, and, but you're not hitting your revenue target, you need to recognize that that's your fault, that you have set a goal that does not align to the correct business outcomes and behaviors that you're trying to drive. Yeah. If you say that all of those leads need to be directly attributable by Visible, because we just made a $100,000 investment in Visible, you restrict it even further. And now you have them getting 12,000 MQLs at the cheapest cost possible, only using trackable channels, which are which will not scale that far, and end up driving a lot of spam from Google ads, like what broader Facebook targeting, YouTube, other places like that. The goals in the attribution model drive all the behavior. And so if you want your marketing team to be able to experiment and find the things that work, score them on metrics that are perfectly aligned with your business's success. And so if you want to grow enterprise pipeline by 75% this year within our top 1000 strategic accounts, then score them on how much pipeline grows there. Yeah. And then set up the measurement system to allow them to do all of the things that could positively move that number. So that's just an example. There's plenty of, there's plenty of other ways to do it and every company is a little bit different, but the core thing here is misaligned metrics or being restricted by, by limited attribution models. Yeah. Nice. And then a pr I think it was a couple of days ago, you shared a LinkedIn post around website velocity and was just seeing if you could just talk a bit more about that and run us through what you were, you were getting across in that post. Totally. So I, as a thesis, I continue to believe that B2B buyers will continue to want to buy in more of a B2C format as time goes on. We've already seen that massively accelerate in the past three years. PLG companies continue to grow. Companies that don't, that are traditionally enterprise and are trying to build a PLG offering to make it easier for buyers. I've personally seen the success as we've opened a free trial to one of our early stage products, how much power there is in like the self-service journey. And so my belief is that B2B buyers are going to continue over time to want more of a self-service journey. And so if they want more of a self-service journey, then the place that they're going to go to transact is your website. 
whether they go to your website to say, hey, I need to contact sales because that's what you forced me to do, or I want to start a free trial, or I just want to buy a subscription, touch list, any of those things. I believe that buyers will continue to do more and more of that. And companies should be looking at how, and a lot of companies are looking at this now, what percentage of our revenue is generated through our website? It's a, me- it's a massive metric because the revenue that's generated through your website typically has the lowest cost of sales, the highest sales productivity, the best win rates, hmm. lowest cost of acquisition. There's a lot of benefits to it. And so that's the, the core positioning. Yeah. And then when you think about like, how am I going to get more people to do that? Well, actually, let's get into the pipeline velocity thing first. Yeah. For pipeline velocity, right? So you're looking at the number of opportunities that you're generating, the win rate of opportunities generated through that place that are closed or lost, sales cycle length, and ACV. And so recognizing that, that and salespeople look at it this way, marketers don't usually look at it this way, that you actually have four levers to grow revenue create more opportunities that you win at the same rate, same ACV, same sales cycle, or lower sales cycles, increase ACV, or increase win rate. And when you look at website pipeline velocity, I think it becomes a very interesting surrogate for overall market demand. If you have more people coming to your website saying, hey, I want to buy now, the, t- the tide lifts all boats. Your partner channel works better, your outbound works better, your event events work better. So it just becomes a really interesting business surrogate. And then trying to optimize not only how much like pipeline and revenue we're creating through our website, but how do we get greater velocity out of it? How do we get higher ACVs? How do we shorten sales cycles through sales process optimization, getting buyers that are further down the buying process, making it easier to buy, things like that. And I just think it's a, re- it's a really powerful thing to look at as a business looking at pipeline velocity across all major pipeline sources, looking at it across outbound website, low intent lead gen events partner. I don't think really applies here, but looking at it across all, basically all of your main sources of pipeline and revenue. And you can illuminate a lot of different things. Like if you looked at pipeline velocity between your BDR outbound channel and your website, you might find, and then decide how to scale your business based on that data. You might make different decisions than just looking at pipeline. And then in terms of that, you mentioned briefly that you had been testing out the, the free trial for one of your own products. Is that for the Vault, is it? or Absolutely. The Vault is our membership and research product, yes. And so yeah. about two weeks ago, we launched a free trial motion. We've had more than a thousand nice. people sign up. We're starting Amazing. to get self-serve with people just buying and checking out. When before we would sell it through like an enterprise sales motion, it took two or three calls. And there's the feedback overall when we went into those calls was like, hey, like it's nice to talk to you, but I would have just I would have just bought this on my own. I didn't I yeah. didn't need to have this call. <laughs> yeah. And so what and additionally, when you go self service, you you automate a lot of the legal back and forth that happens. And so that and it makes it just generally makes it easier for a B2B company to buy. So that has been a really interesting experience for me so far to go from needing salespeople to sell this type of 12 yeah. to 18 to thirty thousand dollar a year deal to a customer buying it the, themselves super fascinating super powerful and in terms of bit of a, a selfish question for us as an agency in terms of the the vault as soon as you had announced it and you were talking about it that kind of uh, do it do it yourself almost like you get access to all of this but then you can implement it yourself and do it like this is something that we've been thinking about as well like i suppose was there any challenges getting that set up and put out or any worries in your mind about how it might say cannibalize your other product and then secondly in what kind of situations would you not recommend it or, or recommend something like that a lower offering to sit alongside your main product hmm I think recognizing that the the ideal customer profile for these two yeah. products is very different for the vault. My expectation is that in the future, it will be as many B2B marketers use this product as they as use LinkedIn. Yeah. It'll yeah. take some time. But my, my expectation is that what will happen and we'll build a B2B marketing network with proprietary unbiased research and information a large social network, events, other like other things like that, groups that provide tons of value for B2B marketers where they can interact with their peers, discuss how they're going to buy things, get new jobs, level up their career, learn. So I expect that product is suited for all B2B marketers and potentially even farther reaching to revenue mm-hmm. operations, marketing operations, other specialties. 
and then our core business offering actually has a pretty well defined total addressable market that is significantly smaller than that. Yeah. So it's almost like a, there's almost like a sweet spot inside of it, maybe 10% of the, maybe even less than that, 5% of overall B2B marketers are actually a really great fit for the core things that we do right now. Yeah. And so, and then over time, the goal is to continue to expand products and services to address a greater amount of the total addressable market. Perfect. Thanks a lot for your time. And I suppose the final question really was anything that we didn't cover today that you wanted to mention or to highlight or any, any other questions? Nothing pops to the top of my head. Nice. So I'm not nice. Gonna force it. Cool. And if people want to check you out, where's best to follow you and find out your updates? Yeah, you can follow the podcast on Apple or Spotify, Revenue Vitals. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way to reach me on DM is either LinkedIn or Instagram. That's Chris Walker 171 yeah we know that because that's how we got here the dm is always working well thanks a lot for your time thanks everyone for listening